Ghana for I agree to you. Mr. President, Nanado Danko Kufuadu, I agree to you. All the good people of Ghana, in Ghana and beyond, I agree to you. It is time now for me, Benjamin Akako, to share with you my blunt thoughts for today. And I've titled it, Ghana, a giant on its knees with misleaders without keys. Ghana, a giant on its knees with misleaders without keys. You know, this morning, I want to take us down memory lane. Many decades ago, I want us to listen to just a little bit of that song, Ghana Land of Freedom by E.T. Mensah. And I'll share some reflections with you on it. Ghana, we now have freedom. Ghana, land of freedom. Ghana, we now have freedom. Ghana, land of freedom. But where is the freedom? We are not economically free, not even mentally free. We ought to rather be singing Ghana, land of bondage. Where are the fruit of the labor our forebears fought so valiantly for, to the point of spilling their blood? Where is it? Is this going to the IMF for 17th time, with our education a messy hodgepodge, with a cost of living at a ridiculous high, with our politics filled with many con men and women, I'm not saying all of them, but many, where we chastise any criticism against the powers that be, determining it to come only from detractors, with the perilous nature of our roads. Is this the Ghana? our forefathers dreamt of? No, I assure you. If they had a dream, which they did, this was not it. This is a far cry from what Kwame Nkrumah, Ignatius Kutu Echampo, and others envisaged for this great land. And yes, I just mentioned the Osajifu, the founder of Ghana, in the same breath as a military leader, a coup maker. Why? They did things in Ghana never before seen and never to be seen again after them. With Nkrumah, I don't even need to regurgitate any talk about his massive industrial push, not like what we're seeing now. The factories everywhere, which we left to rot out of stupidity and what the Nigerians will call bad bele, ill will. The making of Tema as an industrial hub, our power systems and energy development. With Ignatius Kutu Echampo, who can forget his operation Feed Yourself? In fact, he stands out as the only head of state who refused to contract foreign loans during his rule, not like we're seeing today. The numerous projects he executed were done with local resources. He purchased the presidential jet, yes, but he actually never traveled in it. In fact, for the seven years that he ruled the nation, he traveled only once outside the country. There may have been reasons, we know. He went to Togo by land, returned the same day by land. He introduced the Operation Feed Yourself program, which led to that bumper harvest of food that we've spoken of since his day. Even fish was lavishly plentiful. Yet today, as Joy Prime's latest documentary, Seva, A Thirsty Island, reveals, children have to source water from a cemetery. The rain is here again with this concomitant flooding, and lives are getting lost again. When you cogitate, when you think of all of this, how can this possibly be in Nkrumah's Ghana, in Ignatius Kutu Champon's Ghana? How? How can we be this derelict in our duty to care for the most poor, the most vulnerable? What could explain all of the misleadership we're experiencing ad nauseum? Now, I saw this piece yesterday, and I'd like to share it with you. In a way, it explains our situation. It is titled, The Thieves in Our Bus, and it says, A teacher received a salary and boarded a crowded bus back to his home, and there was a thief in the bus. The thief stole the teacher's money, he picked his pocket. After the teacher reached his destination, the driver asked for his fare. The teacher dipped his hand into his pocket and found nothing. The teacher's face turned black and blue. He was so embarrassed. The driver, who was now angry, said mockingly to the teacher, Shame on you. You consider yourself a respected person while you cannot afford your fare for transport. Now, as all of this was going on, pride hit the thief's ego. And he was moved to say to the angry driver, My brother, the teacher's fare is on me. The thief offered to help the teacher, his victim. He helped, not out of pity for the poor teacher, but to buy the other passengers trust and confidence. To use some of the stolen money to earn respect before the rest of the passengers in the bus. The poor teacher, who did not understand what was happening, smiled and said to the thief, May God bless you and give, you, give us more of your likes, sir. Some of the passengers also praised the thief. Now, since then, the number of thieves in our bus 
have increased and they continue to receive our thanks and appreciation. The thieves are many a time our misleaders and the bus is Ghana. We are all on a bus where thieves are stealing from us and use the stolen money to buy our trust and earn our respect in a way that we keep thanking them for their kindness. That is the metaphor of the situation of our country, Ghana. The thieves in our bus are increasing all the time because we continue with the idol worship, praising them for returning crumbs from the many things, roads, hospitals, factories, jobs, educational facilities, and more that they have stolen from us. We have to reflect on these things, though, because where Ghana is headed is problematic. I really don't care about the NDC or the MPP. Any government, any leadership that can come and lead properly and take us to the promised land, I will support wholeheartedly. But if you keep coming, whether NDC or MPP, and you fail like we're failing now, Ghana, we now have freedom. Ghana, land of freedom. Where's the freedom? Are you economically free? You can't even manage your own budget. But let's come to the slides, because I have related matters that I want to talk about, which explain why we keep ending up where we are. Let's start with the Tema oil refinery. Now, if you talk about the missing oil saga, still unresolved, look at the sums we've been missing. Gas oil, 105,927 liters. Aviation turbine kerosene. 252,000 liters. That is what we use in the aviation industry. The aeroplanes, that's what they use. Electrical cables, 18 drums. They grew wings and flew away. Until now, we've not been able to resolve the situation. But you look at the management. We've always had management at the helm of affairs here. We still do. Yet the promises are never fulfilled. This is why I talk about misleadership in Ghana. 2017 to 2019, Isaac Osei. January to April 2020, Asante K. Berko. May 2020 to June 2021, Francis Boating. August to March, that is August 2021 to March 2022, Edward Boating. March 2022 till today, in fact, to date, Jerry K. Henson. Between 2017 and now, we've had five of them. The story has not changed. But let's get to Bright Simmons and what he says on this bit. The latest lease of Tor to Torrentco. And nowadays everything is being leased or being sold. You, you heard of the GMPC saga and the backlash from the energy minister. But Tor requires $500 million to $1 billion to address its issues. That's how much we need. So let's approximate about $800 million. The announced strategic partnership with Decimal Capital has faced delays. We all know it. Torrentco Asset Management emerged to negotiate the lease of Tor assets and the credibility of Torrentco is questionable. Why is it that with all of these deals, there, there are always question marks with the entities we want to bring on board? What is it? And incentives are heavily skewed in Torrentco's favors. Of course they will be. Why not? There are interests involved. Let's go to the next slide. But if you look at what Torrentco seeks to invest to revamp Tor, then you get the dynamics. We're looking at what? 500, to, $500 million to $1 billion. How much are they looking to invest? $22 million. Now, the lease period is six years. Six years. We're handing this over to them. The barrels to refine per year, $8 million, And the annual rent is billion. Read between the lines. Next slide. Now, in terms of the economy, I'm going to move now from Tor and get into the economic gameplay right now, the chess board of economic, uh, Ghana's economic situation. Our president has been saying difficulties in the economy were exacerbated by the reckless behavior of ratings agencies that engaged in downgrades, shutting Ghana out of the capital market and turning the liquidity crises into solvency crises. No wahala. Would have wanted to borrow more. You know, so. President, let's go to the next slide. But if you look at this, you would see that, in fact, nothing has changed in terms of the ratings we've been given over time and now. There was no need to do this because they have not been unfair to us. They are using the same metrics. Let's go to December 2003. Fitch gave us a B grade. 2006, Fitch, B plus. 2017, 
S&P gave us a B minus. September 14, a B. Moody's gave us a B3 in January 2020. And again, of course, when we're in the height of our economic doldrums, a CAA3. Then you go back to this and look at the agencies, Standard & Poor's and Fitch. Moody's as well. In March 2009, they gave us a B plus. That was under the, the erstwhile administration. Then we had March 2014, a B. January 2022, B minus. Uh, for Moody's, it was a B3 in April 2020. In 2022, according to Standard & Poor's, of course, our economy was declining and they had to react. A CCC plus, and then of course we hit RD, which is uncharted uh, territory. There has been no unfairness here if you look at the, the, the composition and the comparison. Yet, because this didn't go in our favor, we had to say this. I agree. If we want to have an African system to engage us and assess us, that is fine. But these are established institutions. We subscribe to them. They don't subscribe to us. If you don't want to stand the heat in the kitchen, get out. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if you look at the ratings agencies, according to the Ministry of Finance and its comments, both Moody's and S&P upgraded Ghana's ratings at B3 and B- respectively. And in making their decision, and this is 2021, by the way, so look at the change in rhetoric. In making their decision, the credit rating agencies considered Ghana's improving growth prospects, resilient external sector performance, and continued access to the capital markets, that is the domestic and international capital markets, as essential factors in maintaining the rating and the outlook. You see the difference in language. When it suited us, hail. Hey when it didn't suit us, nay. That is called double standards. It's also called hypocrisy. Now, government debts to the IPPs. This is where I'm going to wrap. I've spoken about energy-related matters, TOR. Now, I want to wrap on the IPPs because Ghana, for we are in a precarious situation. It is no joke. Analysts have spoken to me on this show, and they keep telling me if we don't get the things right in the next few years, Doomsaw will be back. I cannot fathom that because guess what? Doomsaw was one of the major lows for me in this country. Whether it had to do with my academic work, whether it had to do with other forms of work, whatever you had to do, no one wants that. Nobody. Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, we voted you to come and resolve some of these problems. Fortunately for you, your administration did not come and have to deal with Doomsaw. That is the reality. It has been solved. So the best, the least you can do is not get us back down that slippery slope. Because if you do, I don't think Ghanaians can have the heart to forgive you. But here is our rea reality. The IPPs are now unable to cover operational costs and debt servicing. The IPPs themselves. So, to stay afloat, they have called on us to do what must be done. Now, government has been seeking to restructure $1.58 billion in debt. The IPPs are like donkeys digging their heels in. They say, no way, because look, they need money to stay afloat. Now, the creditors, contractors, and stakeholders are unwilling to defer payments any further. In fact, if you look at this last dynamic, which is where I will end, the power cut intention, they have iterated just yesterday that if we don't meet their requirements, about $450 million, which is the equivalent of 30% of the outstanding arrears, it's just about $420 million, but let's cap it off at $450 million. They will be taking away their 60 to 70% of power. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand what that would mean for our energy situation across the country. So Doomsaw could come sooner than later. Now, this is their intention, July the 1st. We have just about how many days to go? Eight days? Just about a week. It's, an emergency meeting was held on the, June the 20th, and the interim payment they demanded, 30% of the outstanding arrears, and government's debt owed $1.4 billion. Do the math. This is where we are. So when some of us talk, we don't talk out of air out of a vacuum. We talk out of fact. This is the true state of the nation, Ghana for. And when we say these things, it is not to encourage any, anyone to do anything nefarious. It is just to encourage the powers that be to do the right things. To know that the water has got to our necks. 
Let it not get to our eyebrows because then we will drown. And to let those who, who are around those that walk the corridors of power, to be honest with them and tell them what is going wrong. I may be a nuisance for many people because they don't like hearing what I, I say, just like the prophets of old in the Bible, but I will say it still. I will not be muzzled. I will not be gagged. I will speak truth to power. That is how society has changed over time. And I'm proud to do what I do on the AM show. These are my blunt thoughts, Ghana 4, shared with you. Hot, raw, unedited, undiluted. God richly bless Ghana and make her great and strong.